ดามาคุสชั่นส์วิดอันเซอร์สฟรอมพระอาจารย์ชยสาโรรีคอร์ดิดออนเดอะฟอร์ทส์ออฟมาร์ช2007อินปากช่องนอร์ทอีสต์ไทยแลนด์ What is the most advantageous learning style? We all have different learning styles, don't we? And, and some people are very visually oriented. Some people are very uh, orally oriented. Some people like to see everything written down. Um, some people like to uh, learn uh, well in, uh, in personal contact and one-on-one -on -one situations. Other people learn better in a group, and it seems to vary enormously. But I think for each one of us to um, to notice, observe um, the the learning style that works best for us. Um, so, as they say, some people might find um, listening as a way that that uh, really learn and absorb what needs to be absorbed. Other people might prefer to read or to observe it from printed word. Um, In particular situations, some people might learn more in a big group, some more in a small group, some more uh, in living alone, and um, this is something that we we're constantly looking at and trying to optimize the conditions for for learning for ourselves and and if we're in a teaching position for for those we're teaching. How does self education? Differ from child education. Well, if you're a school teacher, um, then the children uh, have parents um, who are going to have uh, quite an influence on the children. So you're only one factor involved in the child's education. Even as a parent, um, then. You you share your child's education with the teachers at the school, and also they learn a lot from their peers um, and from the media, um, and so uh, the the, ex the your influence is always going to be um, tempered and uh, mediated by, by other influences. Um, whereas uh, when you're teaching yourself, you you're living with yourself from. You know, every moment of your waking life, and and you have to take responsibility for your for your own education. Um, you have more um, opportunity to adapt the your self education um, to the, as I say, the learning style which is most uh, useful for you, uh, and and so on. So it, you're teaching yourself, and that's. Um, That's going to be easier than teaching somebody else. In the end, um, in that uh, you know what's going on. You're the, it's uh, and it's you, and it's uh, you're the person who means the most to you. Um, for for a child, maybe you have more power in certain. If you're a parent or a teacher, um, in in compelling a child to do things, um, but the results of that and the um, Uh, I say, are also um, conditioned by other influences on the child. Is being a workaholic wrong from the Buddhist perspective? Working hard um, is, you know, is not unwholesome in itself. Um, but uh, I think it's important to. Um, go back to to goals and what you really want to do in your life. What's the most important thing in your life? Um, what priorities do you have? So, if we uh, consider priorities, one's own physical, mental, spiritual health, uh, one's family life, uh, one's uh, responsibilities towards the community that one's li one lives in. And then one's working life, they want to find um, a balance between them all. But if 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 working becomes a compulsion, um, and it means that the other areas of one's life are suffering, um, that one's not able to fulfill one's responsibilities in those other areas, or that um, work becomes a, an escape 
um, from other responsibilities, then, then you say it's not that it's wrong, but that there's an imbalance, and, and ultimately that's um, that's going to lead to to suffering. So you was, what? Why? Uh, why does one work? What's it for? How much? Uh, how does one work? These are all questions that, that you need to be asking yourself uh, regularly. I don't think there's any virtue in, in working great long hours it's, uh, uh, in itself. I mean, it's a kind of uh, Protestant work ethic. Um, you know, that doing something is always better than doing nothing. Um, and, and if you're working in a way that there's some tangible output and that there's a wage involved, then maybe that's a way that you feel that you're doing something, achieving something in life. But uh, I think that if it means that you're neglecting the other more intangible areas of life, then ultimately you're losing out. Which attitude gives rise to relinquishment most easily? We find things difficult to abandon or relinquish because we feel that they contribute to our well-being or they are, they are essential to our sense of self. In other words, we, we feel that the, the value that we derive from them outweighs the disadvantages, the suffering that might arise. So as long as we um, view things in that way, it's unlikely we'll ever be able to develop the, uh, the will and the effort uh, to fully abandon them. And uh, what tends to happen is we force ourselves um, through a sense of uh, duty or because we think that's what we should do. Um, but the relinquishment tends to be only a temporary one. The attachment returns um, perhaps even strong, more strongly than before and we, and we feel rather discouraged. So the, the intelligent way to, to deal um, with this kind of attachment is um, to look again and to see whether it's really as valuable and important to us as we thought. And if we can clearly see the disadvantages of it, the suffering inherent in attaching to it, and if we can clearly see how the benefits we derive from it are a lot less than we originally thought, then relinquishment will take place um, uh, much more easily so we, we have to see that it's something that really needs to be relinquished, that we want to relinquish, that we see the value of relinquishing. These kinds of attitudes are what will lead on to relinquishment in a, in a very natural, unforced way. How does working hard remain wholesome throughout? The the problem about working hard is that sometimes it can become a, an end in itself and that we lose sight of the, the goal of, of working hard. Um, putting forth effort uh, brings, brings up a lot of wholesome qualities, but if we, um, if we lose balance in our life and we start to neglect other areas um, of of our life and just take the, the work as being somehow virtuous in itself, uh, then the wholesomeness of the work is lost. So, so ideally we're trying to, to work in such a way that we feel it's integrated with our, our spiritual life so that we feel in the course of our work then certain um, of the uh, mental um, defilements, negative states are, are gradually diminishing and the wholesome states of mind are, are increasing and, and being nourished by our work. So that um, increase in um, wholesome qualities, decrease in unwholesome qualities, um, that is the standard, that is the reflection that, that keeps the work on the, on the middle path. How do remainders of previous conditionings Hold the mind back. We all start off practice um, with 
baggage, karmic baggage, some of the old conditioning is um, strong, some is weak. Um, in monastic life, the, uh, the conditions are such that um, many old habits um, don't receive any further stimulus um, and they can um, very easily go into abeyance or they don't completely disappear, at least to begin with. Other forms of um, conditioning um, are, are more difficult. Uh, for instance, um, uh, conditioning regarding food, and no matter uh, where you live, how you live, how ascetic your life might be, then you're always going to have to eat um, every day. And uh, if there are certain problems and challenges around food, um, then they have to be um, dealt with in a um, different way. It's, it's not something that can gradually um, disappear through uh, lack of lack of opportunity for expression. So uh, the conditioning, which um, is is still stimulated somewhat um, by one's surroundings, is obviously going to be the conditioning that lasts longer and is more difficult to to reduce. What childhood needs tend to echo longest in the mind? Childhood needs um, are, you know, vary to a certain extent according to the particular circumstances of a, of a child's life. And again, the, those, those needs which have not been met um, during childhood um, tend to um, still seek to be met um, in adulthood. Um, so even strong childhood needs, if they've been more or less satisfied um, during childhood, will not necessarily um, become apparent in, in one's adult life. I don't think that um, can point to any one particular need and say uh, this need or that need, but it very much depend on the individual. How does temptation work? Temptation um, means that there are events, there are stimulus through eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, which um, <coughs> uh, stimulates the defilements that we have, of, uh, greed and um, desire and so on. Um, and there is uh, sometimes a struggle in our minds between that sense of what's appropriate, what's, um, what's correct, um, what kind of behavior would be consistent with our ideals, and that emotional desire to uh, experience the pleasure of the object. Um, when there's that kind of uh, tension between um, our sense of what's right, what's appropriate, and what at that particular moment we'd find exciting or stimulating, then um, sometimes the rational mind will, will kick in with uh, reasons why it's really all right. And um, various um, thoughts arise in the mind to undermine the sense of restraint and um, <clears throat> and the, the breaks that we have on our, our behavior. So, so temptation uh, can be on the non-verbal level, just this invitation to some um, intense experience uh, which we still uh, give value to, and it can be accompanied by um, various kinds of thoughts which um, seek to undermine our commitment to restraint. Where do people overestimate themselves most easily? Overestimation um, is, is very common in, in spiritual life and it tends to um, be more of a problem in communities where um, the 
the meditator is not getting any reflection from teachers or from fellow practitioners. So if a uh, community is, is one in which everyone keeps themselves to themselves, who, who doesn't feel able to give any reflection or feedback to, to others, then um, certain people will tend to overestimate their, their achievements, just as other people perhaps will tend to underestimate um, their achievements. So the, the important thing, as for, certainly in the first few years of um, practice, is to find a community in which there's a, a real honesty and a, a sense of goodwill and um, interest in helping each other out and also in learning from um, the experiences and, and the input from other people. How does purity nourish a person? Well, um, purity means that the mind is uncluttered and the mind is simple and clear and bright. So uh, with the purity of of sila as a basis, then um, the mind um, can become purified of the hindrances, purified of wrong views, uh, purified of doubts and attachments, um, eventually um, purified from, from all defilements. So there's a, a cumulative um, effect as the, the basic levels of, of purity in our conduct um, become more developed, then the higher and more subtle, profound levels of purity uh, gradually appear in the mind. What is the meaning of a strong mind? Uh, a strong mind is, is one uh, which is able to bear with the truth of things, a mind which is not um, upset and a mind that doesn't waver um, in the face of the various vicissitudes in life, the ups and downs, the things we like, the things we don't like, uh, but is able to uh, maintain a, a stillness and um, integrity um, in the face of um, uh, temptations and phenomena that will tend to uh, encourage uh, greed, anger, delusion. Uh, a strong mind is a, is a mind which is calm in the midst of confusion, a mind which is kind, generous in the midst of cruelty and selfishness, a mind which is able to um, maintain its standards when there is no support for that maintenance of standards. What makes practitioners contented with restraint? In any form of practice uh, needs to be accompanied by a constant reflection on the, uh, the pain, the with uh, the drawbacks, the problems of not practicing and in particular the value and the results um, of successful practice. Um, in the case of restraint, when uh, we keep an eye on our mind and, and begin to recognize the extent to which the mind becomes more calm and more um, at peace with itself, um, through restraint, how um, much more malleable and um, teachable the mind becomes, um, then the sense of satisfaction with, with restraint takes place. If one still um, feels a sense of regret that somehow you're missing out because you're not experiencing things, then a little of tension arises in the mind and sooner or later um, the restraint um, breaks and one uh, binges um, on something or other for a certain time until one re-establishes the, uh, the sense of restraint. 
So this wisdom and reflection is what um, supports and strengthens the restraint and gives us that um, interest and enjoyment of it. What is the most substantial challenge in controlling the mind? There are so many um, challenges to control the mind. Controlling the mind, training the mind is, is the most difficult thing that, that any human being could take on. And um, even amongst uh, those who've committed themselves to monastic life and, and living um, in the midst of conditions which are uh, as supportive as you could possibly find, most people still find it very difficult. Um, the, um, the various hindrances um, that arise um, are, are grouped into five. You have sensual desires, forms of um, aversion, dislike, dissatisfaction, sloth, torpor, boredom, and mental agitation, guilt, and, um, Doubts and um, skeptic, uh, skeptical um, <laughs> considerations, all, all these, um, all these mental states um, militate against any kind of, of inner peace and the arising of any kind of wisdom. Um, the particular hindrance that arises strongly and is a particular obstacle, or the last obstacle for for a person before their mind lets go and becomes peaceful, again will depend a lot on their personality. Um, very um, energetic um, people uh, tend to have, very, of course, very little problem with, uh, with sleepiness and torp uh, sloth and torpor, but they um, can often have to um, really struggle with um, mental agitation um, some people are kind of laid back, quite already quite peaceful, and gentle in their personality. Um, few um, really aggressive and um, active um, thoughts in their mind. But as the mind becomes more peaceful, then they uh, have real struggles with sloth and torpor in a kind of blurriness of mind and lack of clarity. So um, there are many different um, challenges, obstacles, and the particular one which is most difficult for a person um, will depend on, on many uh, factors, one of them being their own personal history and their, their personality. What are the signs that the mind is ready to release a defilement? When, when the mind uh, reaches uh, that point of readiness to, to let go of a defilement, there tends to be a sense of, of fullness, of, of satiety, of, of that's enough, a um, sense of um, boredom and, and lack of, of um, interest and enjoyment of that object. Then there's a sense of it, it's now a burden, it's something that's not fun anymore. Um, like if you, uh, to give a comparison, you watch a magic trick. Um, as long as you don't see the sleight of hand, then um, you still you can watch it many, many times and find it just as enjoyable. But the moment that you can work out how the trick is done, um, you catch sight of the, the um, sleight of hand, then the enjoyment in that trick um, uh, disappears. And so that sense of, um, it's not fun anymore, it's enough, uh, it's boring, uh, it's dragging me down. Uh, these, are, these are some of the, um, the, the characteristics of the mind which is about to let go. Although, of course, this may be only a temporary letting go and one has to be careful not to um, be... Uh, to take it for granted and to think that it's necessarily a, a once and for all abandonment. What are the most significant characteristics of integrity? 
integrity means a, a straightness and adherence to to principle, um, a willingness to make sacrifices for principle, um, and I think that uh, the, the characteristics of of integrity are that uh, that sense of of straightness and willingness to um, put your life on the line um, and to make real sacrifices in order to um, to care for and to maintain the principles that one has taken on voluntarily as being most conducive to realization of the highest goals that you aspire to. What thoughts precipitate straying from a good course? Sometimes when we're um, following a good and wholesome course of action, then uh, there may be thoughts arising in our mind that uh, we're not really totally pure in our motivation. Uh, maybe there are some um, hope that there will be some kind of praise or recognition, for instance. And uh, these are um, merely thoughts that arise within the mind, but um, quite often we will give weight and significance to negative thoughts um, in a way that we don't to the positive thoughts. And uh, we can very often um, some feel that somehow negative thoughts are more real and more true. Um, perhaps this is a result of the idea of original sin that we're, you know, there's basically some kind of bad core to to our hearts and minds. Um, but the uh, when the thoughts arise within the effort to do something good. Um, our practice is merely to know, to recognize this as, as another thought, just, just part of the various things that float along on top of the mind in the course of its flowing towards an object. Um, and we don't take it too seriously or to consider it to be um, necessarily a, a true reflection of our, of, of our intention such. And when we know that uh, we set off to do something with a very pure heart, then the impure thoughts that arise are seen merely um, as passing um, phenomena that arise and pass away. Which harmless looking defilement is the worst of all? Some defilements are you know, very obviously harmful to us. Everybody, I think, would recognize that anger and, and hatred are, um, are defilements, that they're not beautiful things and not things that should be um, supported or, or um, developed in life. But the, um, the defilements um, that manifest as, as desire uh, for sensual pleasures and for, um, for love, for respect, for recognition, for fame. Those kinds of um, desires, the, the um, defilements of acquisition, um, the idea that we get something and that will be uh, somehow better or more happier, these are a lot more difficult to see through. Um, particularly in an acquisitive culture, in a materialistic um, consumer culture, the idea the more you have, the better it is, um, then um, seeing that in many cases that's not really true uh, can be quite, quite difficult and, and threatening uh, for people. The idea of accumulation is necessarily a good thing um, is one that not many people are willing to challenge. What is the most underestimated virtue? Virtues um, have their, uh, their stars and their unsung performers, and when we talk about the 
uh, Brahma Viharas, the positive emotions, then uh, loving kindness and compassion are, are those two which are spoken of most uh, most often. But the third and the fourth uh, of those um, uh, of those emotions are, are equally valuable and important to develop in life. And the ability to rejoice, to um, truly appreciate the goodness, the success um, of others um, is um, it's a virtue which ennobles the mind, makes the mind very beautiful and it, it's one that um, ensures that we have a constant access uh, to positive feeling because the amount of goodness and kindness um, around us every day um, is incredible and it's just a matter of tuning in uh, to something which is already there. Um, equanimity is not uh, often seen as um, a virtue um, or something that um, needs to be developed in life. Um, there is a great praise for, for passion and the idea that uh, equanimity means passivity or um, lack of interest um, a way of ducking out of responsibilities, turning off. Um, these kinds of wrong ideas about equanimity mean that it, it's often not uh, considered a goal of spiritual life. But equanimity, um, in the, the sense that the Buddha um, taught this virtue, means the ability to maintain a, a balance, an equipoise, um, in the face of a strong encouragement and stimulation towards uh, anger and, and love and hate, um, strong attachment and aversion. And this um, equanimity um, is a refuge uh, for us um, and allows us to um, refrain from wasting unnecessary emotional resources on, on things that um, are unchangeable things that or we are not yet in the position to do anything about. So rather than fretting about our inability to uh, increase happiness or reduce, alleviate suffering, we are able to dwell in this neutral state which is full of a readiness to act whenever the situation changes and whenever we are able to act effectively. So it's that resting emotion um, which is a balance to the more active um, emotions of, of um, loving-kindness and, and compassion. What good thoughts tend to give rise to bad ones? Any, any good thought, um, if it's taken for granted, or we start to identify with it as being who we really are, um, can lead to problems. Um, if we um, are virtuous and then uh, we may find ourselves offended by the unvirtuous, if we uh, feel superior to them. Um, if you uh, meditate and the mind becomes peaceful, you start to feel superior to someone who's um, still very agitated, um, then um, this means that the defilement, mental defilement, has um, taken over, enveloped the mind without us realizing it. So um, whenever this sense of being superior, being better uh, than someone else arises in the mind, then whatever the good quality, whatever the good thought that has arisen um, that good thought becomes um, uh, becomes a bad thought, if you like. It becomes uh, an unwholesome um, dhamma in the mind. What makes the mind most fearless? The the thought that you have nothing to lose um, it makes you completely fearless. And the things that we, we think we have to, to lose are body, feelings, perceptions, thoughts, 
sense consciousness, what we call the five khandhas. So the extent to which you see that you're not really the owner of those things, that they are um, impersonal phenomena arising according to causes and conditions, um, then uh, in the absence of any attachment to them as being self or belonging to self, then the mind becomes completely fearless. What kind of meticulousness fortifies the mind most against external triggers? My mindfulness has to be um, very refined. It has to be um, particularly scrupulous and keeping track of the movements of the mind at every moment. And um, uh, there has to be a, a sense of context, where we are in relationship to other people, um, what we're doing, time and place, um, and that effort to be very clear, sharp, bright, aware, um, performing our duties, our responsibilities with that sense of respect and interest uh, means that the opportunities for um, unwholesome thoughts to sneak into the mind are much reduced. There's just not that much uh, room. There's no real gap in the, in the mind's defenses for it to get carried away, swept away by unwholesome thoughts. So, so you ground yourself in the, in the present moment through attention to uh, both to the details and the, uh, of, of one's uh, actions, but also uh, at the same time um, being aware of the context in which those actions are being performed and the, and the long-term and short-term goals which we're seeking to achieve through those actions. What makes the mind want to watch itself? When we, when we meet uh, great teachers, people who have uh, put um, many years into training uh, their minds and we see how inspiring they are, um, how, uh, how peaceful they are, how kind, compassionate they are, um, how, how impressive they are in every aspect of their life, then the, the interest and the commitment to following in their footsteps and trying to, um, to realize what they've realized um, becomes very strong. What makes the mind give up the wish to become somebody else? When you start looking at the mind very closely, um, you begin to see it's a very nebulous thing and a lot of things that you took for granted, a lot of ideas you had about who you are start to dissolve. And um, as the ideas of who you are dissolve, then the ideas of changing yourself from being this person to being another person um, disappear by themselves. Um, as long as you, you, know, you have an idea about who you are and you think, I don't want to be this kind of person, and then you have an idea, well, perhaps if you um, meditated and you were very good, you could become a different, better kind of person, um, then you're, you're practicing with a very uh, mistaken view. Uh, and that mistaken view is um, uprooted merely by looking at what's, what's really going on rather than accepting some kind of Buddhist dogma. Um, but can you find this person you think you are? Um, I think it's, uh, you find it's impossible. And what you, what you see are a lot of things arising and passing away, certain patterns, certain trends, certain habits but nothing that you can point to and say, yeah, that's me, that's who I am. And that's uh, insight which um, can revolutionize your whole attitude to yourself and, and to others. What type of reticence contributes most to a beautiful, holy life? Um, 
the um, turning away from, the refraining from any actions and speech um, that hurt uh, oneself or others um, is the, the basis of, of the holy life. The, <clears throat> the ability to refrain from that which is um, overblown, unnecessary, um, and that which complicates things, that which contributes towards needless, endless proliferation, um, is the, the kind of reticence um, that strengthens one's practice of the holy life um, substantially. What type of meditator comes out strongest in the long run? In the long run, um, the meditator who perseveres, keeps at it, um, doesn't um, become negative about meditation, and does, isn't seeking um, some special kind of experience to, to validate his practice, um, one who has um, clear-cut goals um, and works towards them, but is not comparing himself, judging himself with others, not competing with others, um, but um, puts effort into the practice through um, faith in the Buddha, the Dhamma and the Sangha, um, and um, makes one's practice an, an offering to the Buddha, expression of one's um, gratitude for, for the teachings. Uh, someone who's um, committed to sticking with it through thick and thin, not in a uh, very uh, kind of perfunctory, automatic way, but having that creativity and interest in working with problems, finding fresh, skillful means to deal with the challenges that arise. This is someone who in the long run uh, will be successful, someone who never thinks that they've got it worked out, that they know everything they need to know, someone who's always ready to, to listen, to learn, um, even from those uh, much younger and uh, more inexperienced. Um, this is a characteristic of, of someone who will be successful. What is the best type of pain? Uh, the best type of pain, if there is a best type of pain, is that which um, is, uh, is clear, clear um, enough to be a subject of contemplation not so strong um, that it um, overwhelms our mindfulness, um, sort of pain that arises from a non-threatening source, not something which is going to have any um, serious effect on our health. Um, we want to be able to look at pain uh, and see it as a phenomena that arises and passes away to see uh, it's constant uh, movement to see the the nature of of the of the pain, its particular characteristics, the way that they change and fluctuate. We want to be able to see pain as pain rather than my pain. We want to be able to see the impersonality, the conditioned nature of pain. We want to be able to um, abandon all the mental reactions to pain such as fear, anxiety, anger, uh, despair and so on and so forth until uh, we are aware of the pain um, just as a physical phenomena, not as a complex phenomena combining both physical and mental um, qualities. In other words, we want to, uh, we want, if, if we are going to look at pain, we want to have uh, the pain which we are able uh, to investigate in such a way that we see the three characteristics very clearly and can abandon our attachment to it. 
what makes the ordinary mind so impervious to the idea of non-self. Non non self is is this teaching of impersonality, or that there's no um, uh, permanent abiding essence. There's no um, there's no real um, permanent me uh, standing behind uh, the body and the mind. Now, one of the reasons <coughs> why uh, that's so difficult for us to see is that. We do have a certain amount of control and a certain amount of power over the body and the mind. For instance, we can hold our breath. Um, we can decide, "I'm going to hold my breath," and you can stop breathing. Um, but after a, a certain number of seconds, um, you can't. No matter how strongly um, you exert your willpower, uh, you can't continue. To hold your breath, so this this shows that we do have a certain amount of control, but within the parameters, within the boundaries which are given us by nature. But that small area, that small window of control, um, is what supports and and upholds this attachment to the sense of self, the controller, the owner, um, the and the the one in charge, who I really am. What type of knowledge is dangerous to the mind? If if we um, absorb a lot of information um, and we uh, develop skills of analyzing information and to uh, developing um, theories and <coughs> procedures, um, ways of manipulating the material world, but we lack uh, any moral, um, much, uh, emotional maturity, then, then that knowledge uh, may well be used uh, in a way that's harmful to ourselves, to others, to the society, to the world we live in. <clears throat> so having um, a clear sense of uh, one's responsibility um, to oneself and to um, all sentient beings um, is a way of preventing any knowledge that we acquire from from being used in uh, in destructive and harmful ways. Why does the mind tend to overlook rashness as precipitating factor? We identify a lot with with rationality, and we like to think of ourselves as being rational, of um, thinking things through and making decisions based on our analysis of of the situation. But I think when we we look a little bit more closely, it can be quite sobering to see how often uh, we weigh things up, uh, pros and cons, um, advantages and disadvantages. And yet, uh, in the end, um, we make a decision in a very rash kind of way. Just one, one or the other, according to the emotion of the moment. And that much of the analysis, that uh, the rational thought that preceded it, um, is completely wasted. And so we just, out of a sense of impatience, and just wanting to get this thing over and done with. And not to have to think about it anymore, not to have to worry about it anymore. Just want to, um, <clears throat> just to go on, to move on to something else. Um, that one just grasps at one uh, uh, at, at the decision that one's made. So uh, rashness and, and impatience um, is perhaps much more of a determining factor in our actions than we we would like to accept. How does long-term perspective recondition the mind? Some people, or many people, when uh, they meditate, um, see practice as a, a very short-term 
um, endeavor and a uh, matter of seven day courses, ten day courses and and uh, t- the idea of meditating for a number of years um, would be quite daunting um, to them. The idea that one would have to put years and years of work into spiritual practice before any really appreciable results would be highly discouraging. But in fact, the Buddha teaches us to take an even longer uh, term perspective than this um, and to see things in terms of lifetimes. So if we uh, consider uh, how uh, lifetimes of effort in order to realize the truth, um, then um, just a, a few months of hard work will, will uh, have a completely new perspective. Um, building barami, uh, doing wholesome deeds, um, many of the supportive practices which um, uh, complement meditation uh, will make much more sense when uh, we see that it's probably quite unlikely that we're going to come to an end of rebirth in this life and that um, practicing in such a way that we are creating the causes and conditions for um, for um, a uh, for future births in which uh, our ability to practice and carry on um, our our endeavors uh, will be um, facilitated. That seems to be, make much more sense. So in, in one sense it gives us uh, that more kind of coolness, uh, relaxed attitude, and at the same time, um, if, we're, if we reflect on this intelligently, um, it does give us a sense of urgency in that we can't be completely sure that we will have um, the kind of advantages uh, that we have now in future lives, who knows? And so um, this life is a precious life, and this life is one uh, in which we should um, be willing to put forth uh, great effort while we do have the opportunities, we do have the supporting conditions that, that, that are present. What is the best emotional content to support earnest effort? When we uh, put forth effort um, in such a way that, that we, uh, we feel that we are following in the footsteps of the Buddha, of the great teachers, we, when we have the faith and the confidence that this effort will have results, um, that nothing that we do is lost, um, that sense of faith, uh, confidence, um, the chanta, the desire for truth, the desire for goodness, um, which is the wholesome kind of desire and is the counterpart to the unwholesome desire, which we call tanha. When we have this this kind of uh, motivation, uh, these emotions are, are strong in in our mind, and then uh, putting forth effort. Um, becomes uh, more and more effortless, as it were. It's, uh, we're still putting forth effort, but there's this interest and delight and, and total assent to um, the, the actions that we're performing. What opens the mind to new perspectives most easily? When you develop this sense of yourself as a student, as a learner, taking um, great joy in, in finding out new things and, and expanding, uh, extending boundaries um, and taking nothing for granted, never believing that you've got it all worked out, um, then new, um, <coughs> new challenges, new interests, um, unexpected experiences, these are all um, welcomed because 
with the Buddhist teachings as a refuge, you feel that you have a, a map, you're not going to get lost, and that with the right um, attitude, then whatever occurs um, can be um, included, can be absorbed, and um, will provide um, benefit nourishment on, on the path that one's following. So there's not this sense of you having to sort of shut yourself down. You um, accept a certain number of teachings and and develop strong faith in them and, and try to protect your mind from any kind of, uh, of doubt in them and fortify your mind with faith. Um, this is a sense of learning and understanding the way things are using the mind which has the refuge in Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha as, as, as one's anchor and one's, um, uh, or, or in another simile, as, as, as one's map, and then um, being willing to accept anything that arises and having the confidence that you can deal with it. What memories tend to endure over the others? Sometimes it's really difficult to find any any pattern to to the kind of memories that uh, stick in your mind. I don't know about you, I, some uh, memories of childhood that that stick in my in my mind seem quite inconsequential, and I can't for the life of me see any real reason why they should be there when other things that I feel perhaps I should remember and I can't. Um, but uh, generally speaking, those things that uh, have some strong emotional impact upon you at the time or resonate with some basic themes in, in, in your life um, are going to be ones which are more easily retrieved or which um, stay closer to the surface um, of the mind. Um, I found in periods of meditation retreat that certain memories uh, popped up that um, uh, of incidents that I completely forgotten but that they must have been there somewhere um, in the unconscious and, and um, for instance seeing some events and um, experiences in childhood which somehow seem to uh, uh, prepare the way um, for uh, the choices I made in later life, particularly that of becoming a monk. Um, so I would, I would say that uh, uh, memories of things which had particular emotional impact seems kind of the obvious um, uh, example of memories that, that stick around. But sometimes, as I say, I, I can't find any reason at all why, why some of these memories are there in my mind. I don't know about you. What kind of person can be considered deep? A, a wise person is, is someone uh, who doesn't hurt himself, herself or others. Um, that's how you know how someone's wise, being able to talk at great length on abstruse subjects, to use difficult words, to manipulate sophisticated concepts um, is not necessarily um, a sign of wisdom. Um, Ajahn Chah, my teacher, um, said that uh, many uh, very well-educated people um, are like vultures, that they fly very high up in the sky, um, but when they feed, they feed on very, very um, dirty and disgusting things down on the ground, meaning that uh, many people can dwell in a very refined intellectual sphere and can speak very convincingly on philosophical matters, um, but when it comes to their bodily appetites, then they can be uh, as coarse as, as the next person. So the um, the wise person, the sage in, in Buddhism, the deep person, if you like, um, is one whose uh, intellectual um, understanding is accompanied by 
um, very deep emotional uh, maturity, spiritual maturity, which is expressed in a way of life which is totally harmless, guided by principles of kindness and compassion. So compassion is the, uh, the proof of, of wisdom, if you like, just as uh, wisdom is the proof of compassion. These two virtues uh, always go together. From your experience, what inspires you most in a monk? Um, when I see a monk who has um, given everything they have to the monastic life, both to their own spiritual practice and to the welfare of the community, monastic community in which they uh, in which they live, they have that sense of uh, gratitude um, and responsibility uh, towards uh, the monastic community in which they receive their training. Um, when they have a sense of uh, gratitude and interest in commitment to repaying um, all that they have been given by the lay community in whatever way um, they may may find to do so. Uh, these are qualities I find inspiring. Um, a monk who is is um, peaceful, wise, and compassionate. Um, these are the the qualities that that I look up to and revere. From your experience, what gave you most faith? in Luang Po Cha? Well, from the moment that, that uh, I met uh, Luang Po Cha, I, I just had this very strong confidence that, that he had realized enlightenment. And of course, that, that's not a, a rational judgment. I didn't have you no know, way that I could tell whether something that was true or not. But that, that sense of <clears throat> confidence just arose naturally, spontaneously the first time I met him and, and never left uh, me afterwards. I was someone uh, who uh, just seemed normal and unaffected, um, someone who was uh, completely uh, himself, someone who had nothing to prove, um, someone who didn't need to be anybody, someone who could um, completely, naturally adapt himself and his expressions according to what he felt were the needs of his students at any particular time, to the qualities that uh, inspired me, his, his teachings, of course, but more his his very bearing, his very being. You know, this was someone who um, <clears throat> exemplified, who, who, who embodied um, all of the inspiring teachings of, of the Buddha. Um, so he, you know, he was the, the proof of the pudding. He was the, the person that um, convinced me that uh, enlightenment is... Uh, something here and now, down to earth, something that is um, possible for people in this day and age. As an abbot, what is the most important characteristic of a strong practice group? I think in a, in a monastic community, it's very important that uh, each person feels that his, his presence is um, valued and that uh, although there is a hierarchical system um, in the monastery that even the youngest, most junior member of the community has a contribution to make and it's one that is um, recognized and respected and valued by everyone else in the community. Um, 
a community in which people feel they have a voice, that they are heard, um, that even though the senior monk might not necessarily um, uh, follow their their requests, their advice, their demands, that it, they are heard, that their thoughts are given time and, and um, interest by the leaders of the community, a community in which uh, people sen- feel a sense of companionship, friendship, common cause, uh, one in which there is uh, um, a uniform um, understanding of and practice of the monastic rules, and in one in which the understanding of, of practice um, and of the teachings of the Buddha is more or less uniform. Uh, so where conduct and view, uh, conduct and understanding, um, are on a basically uniform level, and in which there is that sense of kindness and goodwill and um, uh, good friendship, then I think that uh, monastic community will, will thrive under those conditions. As an abbot, what makes people most easy to live with? When uh, people have confidence in the abbot um, and they are um, willing to train and willing to take his advice, uh, when there is um, lack of stubbornness um, and Uh, attachment to views and opinions when when members of a community uh, are willing to take on, do things that they don't particularly want to do sometimes out of respect um, for their teacher but always within the boundaries of the the monastic discipline Um, then then I think uh, we have a very um, positive situation um, in in our monastic order. The uh, the monastic discipline, the vinaya, provides the um, the framework for our life together. And so one has this um, uh, reflection that um, whatever the abbot will ask us to do, um, even if it's something that's very difficult or something we don't feel we're really up to, he will never ask us to do anything unethical or which will lead us to to break any of our precepts. Um, So that's the safety net and something that gives us the confidence to perhaps um, go beyond um, what we we thought we could do. Um, Because there there is no, no danger of us ever um, losing our way. What are the characteristics of a great friend in the holy life? A good, a good friend is someone who's, um, who's there for you through thick and thin, um, someone who um, is willing to tell you things that perhaps you don't want to hear sometimes, Um, someone who uh, will be giving you moral support, um, good advice in times when you're under pressure and when you're finding things difficult, Um, someone who in whose presence uh, you feel the good qualities and the wholesome dhammas are nourished, arise easily, um, whereas uh, in whose presence the unwholesome dhammas uh, receive no stimulation at all um, and almost seem to uh, wither or, or go into uh, hibernation. What kind of person is most important to avoid? You know, the most uh, important person to avoid is someone who has no sense of shame, no, uh, no restraint, uh, no respect for uh, Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha, someone whose presence you feel you're being dragged down 
and that your worst habits and uh, defilements um, are being uh, are being supported, and your good qualities uh, are being insulted or ignored. Um, so this reflection again and again on wholesome dhammas and unwholesome dhammas provides the framework. If someone who might generally be um, a really good person and uh, respected, value a member of a community, but it might be that when you two are together, then some really unwholesome habits uh, start to come to the surface for one reason or another, then perhaps that's a person to, uh, to keep some, some distance from. What are the requisites for successful solitary practice? Before you can, can really live alone um, in such a way that you, you derive benefit from it, you have to be able to, to live in a community. Uh, monks or meditators who seek solitude because they find um, community life too stressful, they find too much comes up, and um, uh, then uh, when they go into solitude, then they also tend to be uh, quite restless and, and lacking in, in peace um, because if you're in a community the stuff that comes up is in the end uh, there has to be something um, coming from within you uh, to make something out of, of the situations and cause the stress and tension um, it's, in other words it's not uh, uh, solely or primarily um, the matter of other people's behavior and just seeking to to um, uh, to overcome those the kinds of emotions that arise in, in a community by living alone is is the wrong way to deal with it and uh, in in solitary life you don't have the same kind of checks and balances uh, perhaps you don't have uh, the opportunity to get quite so peaceful because of responsibilities to community. But on the other hand, if, if the mind becomes low and depressed or uh, problems start arising, then you lack the support of the community and um, friends who will, will pull you out of it or help you to, to pull yourself out of it. So it can be more of an extreme practice. I think that the important thing is to spend quite a lot of time in community first and be dealing with the kinds of issues that arise living in community um, before uh, going into, into solitude. Even then, uh, I think it's most useful for periods of solitude to be uh, punctuated by periods of living in community, um, um, at least short, shorter periods, to see um, what arises and whether one's becoming attached to doing things the way one wants to do them and having things one's own way, um, which can often happen when you're living alone or, or becoming a little bit eccentric or becoming attached to your own ideas and your own views and opinions. So there are all kinds of subtle defilements that can arise in solitude um, that may not arise uh, so easily or so strongly in community without being commented on and being exposed by, by others. What is the most helpful person to have around? Yeah, the most helpful person for an abbot um, is um, an assistant abbot who has very good communication skills because even if you don't, as a leader, consider yourself very intimidating uh, or um, frightening, there, there inevitably um, is a great deal of projection onto authority figures and that many younger members of the community um, may well feel some resistance in going to see you and, and opening up to you, whereas the, the second monk can usually be, have his ear on the, the pulse of the host finger on rather than his ear on the pulse of the community and, and be able to uh, filter things through and let you know what's going on so that you can um, speak with people or give 
talks and things which will address uh, the particular needs of the community. Also, uh, abbots and leaders of any kind of community need a good friend, someone that they can trust and who they can talk to. And um, uh, without, without that, then abbots can sometimes become quite lonely and isolated. So um, having a good number two, um, someone who you really trust, is um, a great blessing for an abbot. If one is interested in practicing Buddhism, how and where does one start? Um, there are, it, that's a difficult question, and that there are so many different Buddhist groups and and Buddhist schools, and some people feel a real attraction to the uh, the Mahayana teachings. Some people a lot more interested in the. Tibetan teachings, others in the Theravada teachings, and I think that um, in the beginning uh, it, one should read quite widely um, and uh, try to uh, gather a lot of information um, and then after a certain period of time to make some preliminary commitment to a more serious kind of focus on one particular tradition and if at all possible to go and stay at a, um, a monastery or a, st- or a meditation center and to um, do a meditation course and get some real grounding in the, the teachings and their practical application. Um, meditation retreats are very, a very good way to, uh, to get a feeling of... of um, you know, really being embarked on on a on a uh, on a practice, and to be able to get good advice from a teacher, and and to get some uh, a really clear, firm start on the way of practice.